Uh, Steven is a double degree student, so he's been here for a minute, which is fine, right? I, I, I'm glad to get get to know him over over many years. I don't know. I guess five. It's, it seems like uh, about five. So uh, Steven's a double base and biochemistry uh, double major, and he's you know he's done a lot of uh, research in, in Milwaukee, which he is from the Milwaukee area, um, and he's really interested not only. I think he's a great example of a student who's not only interested in biology from a sort of like squishy perspective, but also the mathematical perspective, right? And trying to, to marry what's, what seems like different ends, even if they are not. Uh, and so this talk is a great example of that. You're gonna see um, how we sometimes use relatively complicated modeling um, ideas and their implementation uh, to model some, some complex systems. So um, it's been really exciting to see this talk come together. I'm excited to see it. Um, and I guess I'll let Stephen take the floor. So, uh, can, I just wanna make sure everybody can see the title slide. So I'm Stephen, like Stefan said, and I will be presenting on using multi-layered molecular modeling to predict and visualize enzyme substrate interactions. So that's this idea of taking the uh, theoretical and trying to model the experiments and the uh, chemistry that we go through in everyday biology. So to start off with, if we have an enzyme like this adenylcyclase, uh, we can see that it binds to this uh, G protein and that then signals this or starts the signaling pathway where it can start to catalyze this ATP to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate reaction, which is important because that ATP going to cyclic AMP the cyclic AMP is sort of this uh, molecule which, which tells the cell and a lot of other proteins and enzymes in the cell that there's something going wrong because it's the end of the pathway for ATP, which is this uh, molecule that's used for energy and reactions in the cell. So it kind of says that there's some stressful environment going on and to then tell the cell that and parts of the cell to work on fixing it. So if we think about what we wanna look at when we're trying to figure out why this um, reaction is important, maybe we want to look at this G protein and how it interacts with the adenylcyclase to then um, open up this uh, active site and proceed to catalyze this ATP to cyclic AMP pyrophosphate reaction. But we have some challenges when we're trying to figure out the structure of the adenylcyclase and how this uh, process happens because we have to, if we want to use crystallog crystallography or imaging to try and understand what's happening between that G protein and the adenylcyclase, we need to first express the protein. So that's putting it either on a cell membrane or in a cell that we can then break apart and study. But the process isn't as simple as just putting it in there. You have to start with identifying that target gene for this specific adenylcyclase, then putting that gene into a plasmid, which isn't always successful, and choosing a viable uh, host cell or test cell expression line. So that would be maybe using a yeast or a mammalian cell because we're looking at a uh, product that is being produced in humans and other mammals. And then once it's in there, you have to then be able to make sure that it's being expressed and get it out of the cell properly, which comes as a problem in purifying the protein because if we want to get the cell out or we want to get this protein out of the cell to look at it with either crystallography or imaging, we need very pure uh, sample, which requires breaking open the cells and kind of sorting out all the red dots, which are junk of other proteins or things that the cell would normally use and the protein that we're looking for, this adenylcyclase. But we can run into problems there as well because maybe with it being a cell membrane protein or binding that G protein, we might not be able to, it might change shape and 
its structure when we go and purify it outside of the cell. So we have this problem with structure or with our imaging and crystallography where we can't get a great picture of the adenylcyclase all the time or other proteins and enzymes. So we can attempt to address that with modeling. Yet a single model, because we're trying to model a huge molecule with uh, hundreds, if not thousands in some cases of atoms, that it becomes very computationally um, comprehensive, especially if we want to model it at the highest level of theory. So a solution to that is that we can break it up into parts. And if we just mo if we look at what we want, such as an active site, we can drastically reduce the number of atoms that we're looking at. But now we have the problem of we're not looking at the entire enzyme and all of the interactions that may be at play so we don't get the best picture of what we're looking for. So an additional solution to that is using a multi-layered model to not only pull apart these different layers and look at them in different ways, but to then try and build around the focus of what we're looking at. So that may be the active site, which we can then identify and model around and have that have a small scope with our highest level of modeling, but so it has great quality of the energy of the interactions going around and we can get a great idea and understanding of what's occurring there, but limit the cost and time because we're drastically reducing the scope that we look at. And then maybe the enzyme structure will be on the other end of that spectrum because it's just trying to show the general structure of how everything, of how all these um, atoms and molecules fit together in the molecule to make a cohesive whole. So that can be done with less quality because it's not having as, as direct an effect on the active site. So it costs less to go and uh, compute this, but we get a similar level of total quality as compared to just modeling that entire enzyme. So if we were to apply this to adenylcyclase, what are some of the questions we would be looking for or asking? Maybe we'd want to start with that G protein and adenylcyclase interaction, like I said before, to figure out what bonds, either covalent or hydrogen bonds, and is, uh, electrostatic interactions that may be occurring, as well as any other interactions to try and get a picture of how that um, binding affects the rest of the adenylcyclase protein. And then maybe once we understand that, we can go and move over to understanding why when it's bound to the G protein or versus when it's not bound to the G protein, what is happening in the active site to allow for the ATP and the cyclic AMP to uh, react and be catalyzed by the adenylcyclase. And maybe we want to look at what would be the difference between this protein being in the cell membrane versus uh, not being in the cell membrane. So the general idea that we're trying to marry here is trying to understand the structure of en enzymes with our computational um, theory, as well as the interactions that they have with their substrates. So hopefully we can get a prediction of how the enzyme is working. So how the, maybe the reaction mechanism of how the catalysis is occurring, or if there are any major structural or uh, conformational changes that are allowing this reaction to take place and what may be causing those uh, conformational changes. So kind of jumping back, a basic thing to understand in the enzyme substrate interaction with these general blobs that I'll be using um, forward is that we have an enzyme which is like before would be made of all of those atoms and make one large molecule. And the active site is where it's doing all of its catalysis and reactions. So a substrate will come into that active site and bind to the enzyme. And then once it's bound to the enzyme, it'll undergo catalysis and release some form of products. So then it can go back and continue that uh, cyclic process. And it's important because again, we can understand those signaling pathways with, such as with the adenylcyclase, and how these pathways work in specific enzymes. But we can also start to think about once we know how this 
uh, pathways working and the reaction mechanism, we can start to design drugs or either for disease enzymes that may cause disease in our own bodies or uh, enzymes that come from foreign diseases like viruses or bacteria and figure out ways to inhibit them so they uh, either reduce their disease severity and have more targeted drugs. So, but the modeling is can be very complex because if we have our enzyme and substrate, they're not just these balls. Like I said before, there are these many hundreds, if not thousands of atoms large uh, molecules that don't really have any similar repeating structures that are consistent throughout the whole enzyme. So when we try to model them in the active site, we have to think about what these interactions are going on. So again, the electrostatic interactions. So if there are any hydrogen bonds going on or the reaction mechanism, so where are covalent bonds being formed or um, how are the electrostatic interactions allowing certain molecules to come in like this pyruvate and NADH and maybe preventing other molecules into the active site. And from there, you can also think about possibly are there any steric interactions and conformational changes that may help hold the substrate and products in place or need to be opened so the substrate and uh, products can either enter or leave the enzyme. And lastly, we just have to think about how this whole structure has a large um, effect on the active site instead of just looking at it at just one point. So one way of tackling this problem is using this method called onion. The name isn't too important, but the general um, idea of the program is that the you separate the molecule into different layers. So you have a structural layer and in blue, which is the largest than an intermediate layer, which supports kind of some things in the active site. And then the core layer, which is really looking at just those reactions, um, just the reaction and catalysis in the active site. And one important thing to understand with onion compared to other molecular modeling is that between the layers you have them added together, it creates a sort of real system where the two models in this version given by the mechanical, re mechanical modeling region and the quantum mechanical region. So in the ethane, that would be the real system is just the ethane itself modeled by kind of the intermediate and the quantum region. And then, but the model system is taking that and looking at just one of those carbons but there's this problem where if you were to just cut that bond in half, you'd be left with cations or radicals or anions, and you wouldn't be able to properly model any of the vibrations occurring between the two carbons. So the solution is to add an additional hydrogen just to act as that, just to put that bond in place so you can model those vibrational frequencies. And from there, we're able to think about what is going on in the models, the core of the model. So this, again, is looking at those molecules that are active in the reaction. So in this uh, case, which is LDH or lactate dehydrogenase, this is active site. We have the pyruvate in red, which is being catalyzed by this NADH in blue, and the enzyme in the sort of purple color or magenta. And that core of the model, we'll just kind of look at these atoms which are directly contributing to the reaction and supporting it to get a, the best picture of the energetics of the reaction mechanism and how the um, enzyme catalyzes the reaction. But as we zoom out to the intermediate part, portion of the model, model, the electrostatic, we look at parts that are semi-important or supporting that reaction site. So those would be electric static interactions like uh, resonance. And we can think of that as kind of thinking about where a electrons are grouping on aromatic rings or other structures that 
share electrons over larger spaces. So in an aromatic ring, that would be at the two ortho and para carbons are where the electrons are most dense. And we can also think of the inductive effect. So how are dipoles being created to support things like hydrogen bonding, which can then, or other um, electrostatic effects, which can then stabilize the active site and either allow certain molecules, whether they're polar or nonpolar, to enter the active site based on what the dipoles in, an act, in or around an active site may be. And lastly, we can have these structural conformations looked at in an inter intermediate model and determine how those electrostatic, may, electrostatic interactions may build to form at, with steric effects to either stabilize or destabilize certain uh, molecules from entering the active site. And lastly is the structural model, which is just taking everything else that was not yet looked at and trying to put it and add it into that general structure. So these would be things that don't have enough electrostatic or other contributions to the active site or portion of the molecule that we want to look at, but instead are still important because their general structure can provide an energetic framework for how we look at um, the rest of the system. So onion then is taking each of these layers and using the smaller layer sort of as a cookie cutter to then go in and create space in the next model and then use that to go create a hole in the next size model so we can then stack them to create a whole real system instead of having each part being uh, disparately modeled. So in one way that this has been used in a paper that I read was for identifying conformational changes. And we can think of conformational changes of an enzyme substrate or enzymes active site as being this open conformation. So kind of opening a door to allow the substrate in and then a closed conformation, which would be like closing the door or holding the substrate in place for the reaction. So that would be maybe like a claw coming in to grab onto when you're playing a claw game to grab a toy, when it comes down, it is open to grab the toy easily. But then once you want to grab whatever toy you have, it latches on so it's easier to pick it up and move it to do whatever, either drop it in the hole or do whatever you're doing, such as solve or such as catalyzing this uh, substrate from its substrate to the products. But we have trouble capturing this. And so we can see that when there is a close, maybe in some of these reactions, such as with LDH, we can see a lower volume and close conformation when the substrate is bound. And we can see that when it's unbound, there's this larger uh, volume. And so we can assume that would be an open conformation. But we can't really see exactly what's going on and where the and how the enzyme changes directly. So we have to turn to something like modeling to figure this out. And we can do that. Or and what they found with LDH specifically was that from going from the enzyme without any substrate to binding the substrate, it was in an open conformation. So the substrate could easily come in. Then it closed for the catalysis to move from substrate to products. And once the products were formed, it was able to go back to the open conformation to release the products more easily. And the way that they showed this was through um, a transition state diagram where the reaction coordinates are how the reaction with the conformational changes and different bindings progressed as the reaction occurred. So in A, we can see the general um, enzyme substrate blob structure. And if we look at A, the colored lines in red and purple represent in red that substrate coming in to bind. And then the purple, that 
cost of binding energy at the open conformation, whereas in black, the that would be the cost of binding if this enzyme was closed for the product or for the substrate to come in and bind. And we can see that initially that equilibrium is lower, but the transition, the transition state, so the energy that must be overcome to form those, to break the bonds that are already there and form the new bonds is then costs more than in the closed state. But as we continue to move along the reaction coordinate to this B structure where we go from the enzyme and substrate to the enzyme and products, we can see that in blue is now the closed conformation. And we can see that the transition state, so the cost of energy that's needed to go from substrate to products is lower when we are in this closed conformation. So we can assume that the closed conformation is stabilizing the reaction so it can proceed more smoothly, which is beneficial in any form of uh, catalysis. And then, especially compared to the open conformation. And as we can continue to the last part, or this part C, we can see that the products are more easily let go in the open conformation than in the closed conformation by that purple and red line in the box. And we can see that the equilibrium is at a lower energy. So it's more, so it has an easier time letting go of the products than having it in a closed conformation, which will again help with the catalysis of the enzyme. And from all of that, they were able to come and determine that general or visualize the structure that we saw before, which is generally this enzyme is in an open conformation, allowing the substrate to come in, then going to this B region where the enzyme closes or goes to the closed conformation. So the substrate and product to product uh, catalysis can occur most efficiently. And then to release the products, it is again goes to the open conformation, so the products are most easily released, and that cycle can continue. And kind of jokingly to look at the um, energy cost, we can think of that like um, having two baby Yodas, and one is a baby Yoda that is on the bottom is kind of normal. He doesn't have anything special about him, but the baby Yoda on top, he has his silly top hat and the kind of a crazy monocle and mustache, which allow him, which kind of demonstrate that he has a bit more money and a bit more well-being to go do things than a normal baby Yoda may have. So if we were to look at this, then it kind of says that that baby Yoda with more um, energy and energy or money can then go and if a store is closed or if our, he can go in and more easily go through, get his baguette, and go on with his day and be happy. Whereas this baby Yoda without anything, he's pretty much out of luck and can't go anywhere because he doesn't have the resources to get through that closed confirmation. So once the confirmation opens, it, the other baby Yoda would be able to go in and get his baguette as well. But that's all fun. But if we're trying to think about how modeling can help us in the real world, one big impact again is drug design, which on average from the beginning of design to being cleared by the FDA can take approximately 10 years. And one impact of modeling is that it can help us in the analysis and design section of this um, drug development kind of circle. So it can help us think about the reaction energies and understand how these um, maybe inhibition sites or active sites work where we want a drug to go. And then we can design drugs more specifically to fit in those sites and work better on them. And in one case that we all kind of are familiar with is today COVID-19 is a big uh, issue and problem, but since it came up so quickly, it's been hard to develop drugs. But the um, 
One target that's been identified, though, is the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, which is involved in cleaving many of the proteins of SARS-CoV-2 and how it replicates. So if you're able to inhibit this main protease, it will then prevent the majority of these proteins from being fully formed and allowing SARS-CoV-2 to replicate and will then lessen disease states or lessen the severity of disease states and hopefully reduce um, the spread. So what they're able to find is that there's, in blue here, is there's this nice inhibitor binding site. And um, one paper that I looked at proposed various uh, reaction mechanisms for alpha ketoamides and then tested them with these um, onion type models. So for pathway one, and pathway two are both very similar. There's the cysteine 145 and histine uh, 41, as well as the alpha ketoamide and water. And the real, or the only real difference is that in pathway one, water is uh, not part of the cat catalysis, whereas in pathway two, it forms a tetrahedral intermediate to help catalyze the reaction. And what they found was in both the gas phase, which is the black line, and the epsilon equals four, which is a more protein-like environment, they were able to find that both of them had these uh, exothermal reaction pathways, which is good because that's what we want with an inhibitor. We don't want it to have yet a higher energy than its uh, initial relative energy because then it would be likely to um, break be more likely to break the bond, have ener enough energy to break the bonds and uninhibit itself or unbind itself from the enzyme, and our inhibition wouldn't work. And another uh, method that they've looked at is using existing small molecule inhibitors and testing how they bind to uh, the main protease. And in this paper, they looked at um, these seven targets and they found that N3 and PX12 were the best, um, bound the best to the enzyme's inhibition site. And one large takeaway is just that what they're able to show is that these two molecules had, had covalent bonds at two amino acids, which means that every coval covalent bond has more energy that will need to be put in to break that bond to release the inhibitor, which means, which then can help either design or possibly throw these in for further uh, experimental trials and use them as possible targets if they show promise to continue to build off for uh, drug design ideas. And hopefully during this presentation, I talked about the power of, and showed how the power of structure in biology can be used and understood through molecular modeling to hopefully ask questions about function and how we can incorporate molecules into these complex pathways, as well as use our understanding of modeling and the structure to create more targeted therapeutics for specific diseases and maybe even create a sort of discourse through uh, computation with experimentation to hopefully improve our drug design or improve the computation itself. Um, and I would like to, and thanks for listening, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Stefan Debert for his help in kind of coming up with this idea for a presentation and constantly helping me improve it, as well as the chemistry and biology departments for all of the help over the years and my capstone group, Ali, uh, Binz, and Max for helping to improve and iterate upon this presentation. And then if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yay. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it looks like Stefan had to step out, but I'm sure that Stephen would be happy to take questions from anyone in the audience.
Uh, I guess I can start. Oh, Clayton has one. Clayton, you should go first. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, this like more of uh, math based quantitative computerized development of molecules. I'm assuming that's more like earlier in drug development or is that like later in drug development? Um, I would say the general idea is to use it earlier in drug development so you can get an idea of what molecule structures may work and you can narrow down your pool of possible uh, small molecules that you can use for as drug warheads. But I would say you can also use it later to help understand what the reaction mechanism is as well and use it on possibly existing molecules so you're not creating things that might have off-target effects. Uh, I can ask mine. Um, you talked about how your your literature review and your, your research was relevant to the COVID pandemic, but I know that one interesting part about the virus is that it's still changing. It's still sort of evolving and that makes the vaccine particularly difficult. Do you think that um, this technique that you talked about will still be relevant as the COVID virus changes to sort of like continuing to model it as the, as the structure changes? Um, I think that's one of the complicated things with any sort of drug design is trying to anticipate what may or may not change. And I think because COVID or SARS-CoV-2, the virus is relatively stable as well as the main protease being so important to the um, journal function and replication of SARS-CoV-2 that it's less likely that a small molecule would or a small molecule target would not work down the line at least in the foreseeable future but they did show in the alpha ketomide article that i read that they were seeing or that between SARS-CoV-2 and MERS and SARS-CoV-1 there were different effects with these alpha ketomides so there are questions about how this will change as a virus or as a virus changes. Awesome, good insight. Allie. Um, it's okay if you don't have an answer to this, but I was wondering, um, to what extent are models like this currently used in drug design? Um, for the most part, what I was able to tell is that I said, with uh, Clayton's question is that they're used in earlier portions of drug design and it seems like it's more academic circles that are using them. But I think that also comes with reading literature and who writes literature coming more from the academic and less from the um, corporate or in the industry side of things. Any other questions for Stephen? Audience is satisfied. All right, well, let's thank Stephen again for his talk. And uh, for those of you following along at home, our next talk is tomorrow, Thursday at four o'clock will be JoJo's senior seminar. So join us again tomorrow and uh, great job, Stephen.